I personally think that I made my films with a kind of a sleepwalking security. I did things which I thought were right, period. And as I said, I had nobody, no model, which I wanted to be like, you know? Okay, Bill. Yes, sir. Sorry, let me go wrong. Speed, quiet, please. Speed. Ten, take one, A and B camera markers. I run away from home. I think any decent human being should run away from home. And after different experience, I landed in, in Belgium. I had an affair with a Eurasian. And friends said, You cannot go on like that. And they sent me to Brussels. You were born in Vienna. I'm born in Vienna. And in Brussels, there was an open, not a restaurant, you know, a garden restaurant. Yes. And in the garden restaurant, they had a screen. When you paid, you saw the screen from the right side. If you didn't pay or less pay, you saw it from the reverse side. And there I saw for the first time a film. How old were you? When, when was that? About? 1970, 1917, 18, such a time, I don't know exactly. I went to a bar and ordered a martini, which I liked already then. And I said, give me a very dry martini. <coughs> well, when he gave me the martini, I drank half of it and said, oh, <coughs> wait a minute, not so dry. So he said, he filled it up and I got one and a half martini for the same amount of money. And then I looked around and when I saw a good-looking girl sitting with an elderly man, I went to the table and said, would you mind if I make a picture of the lady? If he liked it or not, he had to say yes, otherwise he would have hurt the girl. And then I had a slight disappointment. You know, she looked at it and then folded it very small, and put it in her bosom. And I got 10 francs, probably, from the elderly gentleman. And in the meantime, I was working in a cabaret in a very stupid act. And in the cabaret, I met the acquaintance of a young man who was working in a bank, and he wrote, songs. And one day he said to me, why don't we make pictures together? I said, fine. I still was under the influence, as I said to you, moving pictures, you know? Yes. Paintings, I couldn't do anything in these times. So we started to write together. After eight days, I said to him, look, I make you a proposition. You sell them and let me write them. So we did. We sold one or two, and then I had to go to the war. <clears throat> I was different time wounded. Shoulder shot everything. And in 1918, I was sick and tired, and I came back. 
and my nearsightedness, you know, in which I had cheated at the beginning when I told you I was thinking to be my duty to be in the war, you know. Yes. Helped me, and I didn't have to go to the trenches anymore. I stayed in the back country in Vienna. And one day, I had a very, very wonderful sweetheart, a cabaretist, but I didn't have money. Wounded, losing my horse, everything, I had 120 kronen. <coughs> what can you do with that? So I was sitting in a cafe. I remember as if it would be today on the corner of a billiard, when a man came to me and said, please forgive me, Herr Lieutenant. It was very hot and said, who are you? He said, my name is Peter Ostermeyer. I'm a representative of the play, stage play, Sahias. I said, yes, and I was wondering if a uh, lieutenant would take a part in it. So I said, what would you pay? And he said, 750 kronen. I had 120. Sometimes in my life, I'm getting a little intelligent. Not always, not very often, but sometimes. So I said, that is very, very little. And he said, more than a thousand, we couldn't play. Settled. <laughs> Suddenly I had a thousand things. And then came a disappointment for him. He wanted me to play a German over lieutenant, you know, somebody who is more than a lieutenant. Yes. But I couldn't speak German in this way, I mean Prussian. So he was forced to give me the main part in the picture. As a play? It's a play. Mm. A main part in the play, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I played it. And it was a big success. Eric Bommer was serving in Romania, I think, in Secret Service, I'm not sure. He was the head of Tecla Bioscope. And they said to him, you should look at this man. This is a good man for motion pictures. Eric Pommer came to Vienna <coughs> and I wore a monocle, always. And he said, I don't want to have anything to do with this haughty son of a bitch. But he said, look, but we have talked to Mr. Lang. You have to talk with him. He said, OK, I will talk with him. But that's all. Okay. So we started when the play was finished at 10, 10 30. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, I had a contract with Stegler Bioscope as a dramaturg. As a, as a writer? As a dramaturg. A dramaturg is very hard to translate. No, a dramaturg is a, a story. A story doctor. Yeah. And at the same time, Germany was naturally dominating in the war. He had promised me that I would have no trouble with the Austrian army. They would let me go. I mean, after I got my furlough of two months. Fine. So I went there. Many funny things. I checked films. I didn't have the slightest idea about film in these days. In spite that I had written some and some were even filmed. But I don't know anything about cutting or how long and so on, you know. And one day, suddenly, two months later, I got a letter from Vienna 
And a friend of mine said, look, you have to come back or you go to a court martial. I said, they promised they would take me out of the army. They didn't do it. So I went to them and said so and so, and they said, wait eight days. And then came my luck, the Great Revolution. And I had already, <clears throat> in the end of 1918, a job. At the beginning, I wanted to make pictures. I wrote pictures in four days, in the evening, with a bottle of red wine. And in these days, you wrote one scene on one piece of paper so that you could interchange without rewriting everything, you know? Yes. I doctored, as I told you, on films. I wrote films and I wrote part for myself and I started to play. I became very friendly with Eric Pommer. The war was over, so he came. It was a main part in De Bioscope. And he had very important acquaintances in Paris. So one day I wrote a film, I forgot the name. I said, look, I want to make it. He said, all right. I shot the film in four days. And from then on, I became a director. The themes of all of your major films deal in some way with these social evils, with murderers. With social evils, not with murderers. Mm -hmm. With social evils. Wasn't uh, the message of Metropolis at the time could that not be taken as a Marxist kind of message, looking back on it now? I don't know. I haven't seen Metropolis since a long time. What's your feeling about Metropolis as a film now? When I made it, I liked it. When I finished it, I hated it. And for a very simple reason. Because the thesis of my wife, Thea von Harbu, that's a go-between, between capital, the brain, and the hand, workers should be the heart. I didn't believe it. Then in the 50s, anonymously, I got some pages from the Washington Post in which the head of a corporation said he has seen Metropolis and he agrees it is important to have a heart for the workers, you know? Yes. Still, I said, to hell with it. But then afterwards, in the end of the 60s, when I was from time to time working at universities, question and answer sessions, and I ask the pupils, what do you hate in the establishment? They said it is a computer-governed society. And the thing that we miss in it is the heart. And suddenly I said probably I was wrong, and Thea von Habu was right. Now, what about some of the technical effects in Metropolis, Fritz? Uh, these were things, obviously, some of the automation that you depicted. Did they exist or were they purely out of your, were they designed out of your sleepwalking consciousness? In these days, the labs in, the, in, 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 in Berlin didn't exist like they exist here. For example, you couldn't say now, I would like to have this and this, put it into the lab. The people of the lab will do it. We have to do it in the camera. There were no opticals, in other words. 
We didn't even have a big boom. Nothing. Uh, I had a very, very good cameraman, not Carl Freund, Günther Ritter, who died recently, who was, in his way, a genius. You know, he is responsible for the change of the girl into the robot. You know? Yes. And I told him, look, I remember there's a shot where you see the girl sitting and slowly a part of her becomes metal and the other part is still living. Yes. I didn't want to have a straight dissolve from a living person into a robot. Slowly, you know, a leg changed and it came back as an other leg and then again. Well, if you had had the ability to use sound then, would you have used it in Metropolis? No. I tell you one thing. Many years later, I made a film called The Woman in the Moon. And one of the upper echelon of UFA. Woman in the Moon was the Fritz Lang Film Corporation. And UFA had the release. And one of the higher echelon went, I think it was 29 or such a thing, to America. And he saw the first Johnson films. Jolson, yeah. Yeah, and he said, we want to have some sound in the film. And I said, no, I will not do it. Because in my opinion, if you show a silent film and then come sound and then is silent again, you kill the rhythm of the film. So I had a fight with Ufa and Ufa stopped paying the contract to my company. But in the meantime, something peculiar happened. <clears throat> I was sick to hear. And I wanted to become a chemist. There came a man with whom I generally wouldn't have spoken. You know? Mm. A so-called independent producer. I don't like producers. I don't know if you do. I don't. And he wanted me to make a film for him. I said, no, leave me alone. I don't want to make any films anymore. And he came and he came and he came. And nine months is a long time. So finally I said, I will tell you one thing. I will make a film for you. But you have nothing to do than to give the money. You have no right about the theme. You have no right about the script. You cannot make any changes. I have to tell you which actors will be in the film. And when the film is finished, you have no right to cut. Correct? And he said, yes. Otherwise, the film M would have never been made. I was sick and tired about the big films like Metropolis, you know, and so on. And I wanted to have a, a personal film, a film that deals with one human being, with one social evil. And so I made them. One day we walked into an apartment house where a man was accused of murder. We found cut off hands under his bed. Or another one, whom I never met, I heard only about him, who made sausages out of wandering young people, you know? Mm -hmm. But as long as you haven't seen what I saw, for example, let me see a woman in a small shop where you can buy fruits and cans and anything, you know? Yes. Lying killed over the table where she sells things. And the blood drops in, drops, drops, 
Only then you can understand why police is for capital punishment. I said to my wife, Thea von Habu, we want to make the ugliest crime. And we started to think about anonymous letters, you know. And then one day I said, listen, darling, I have another idea. How about a child murderer? I tried to find an actor where nobody would believe that this could be a murderer. No? Yes. And I found Peter Lorre. Peter Lorre came, I don't know where he was born. He was working in a so-called Stegreif theater. That means you told an actor in a theater what it was all about. And he made up the dialogue. Improvised theater. Yeah. Mm. He had not, Laurie hadn't made a film before M. No. And this was not in Berlin. This was outside. But why did you choose him? Why did you go for this particular actor? Because I thought nobody would believe that a human being looking like Peter Laurie could commit horrible murders. You're talking about the roundness of his features, as opposed to... His whole, his whole behavior. The, the murder themselves, the molesting of the child, as in the first sequence, is never shown. There's a the beautiful way you do it, where you see the girl's ball roll away, and it yeah. stops and... No, but no, no, no. The first time, isn't it, when he stands in front of the poster? That's right, and you see his shadow. Only the shadow? Yes. But I mean, what I'm suggest saying is that you never really see the events that he's that he has committed. I want to tell you one thing. I hate to show violence. I did it myself in one or two pictures, because I think that the audience became a collaborator of mine. I couldn't show ten cases what a child murderer did to a child. It would be tasteless. I, I myself would have hated to show it. But by not showing it, the whole audience, everyone in the audience could think about the most horrible thing which he could imagine. And therefore, the whole audience became a collaborator of mine. Is one of the ideas then to make the audience empathize with the murderer and understand him and see the possibility? Not at all. Why? Just the contrary. I have the feeling in seeing him that I understand the way you present this man. He's not presented as a vile outcast of society. He is presented as a, for the first time, I think, in film, as a human being who commits actions that are out of his own control, as though fate has, has caused a quirk in him that made him become a murderer. Do you think that most murders are done from the beginning on with the intention to kill someone? No. There you have the answer. But wouldn't, wouldn't, weren't you interested in making the audience empathize with the murderer to some extent? In which way? But Understand him as a human being rather than condemn him as a killer. I don't know if the audience condemned him. I tell you one thing. I told you before I don't like uh, producers. The end of the film was, Remember the kangaroo court with all the criminals? Yes. Well, real criminals in front. And the hand goes on the shoulder of Peter Lorre and says, in the name of and the quick dissolve. And you saw the bench with the judge 
And he said, off the law, quick dissolve. And then you saw a scene which many, many years later, and I couldn't do anything anymore. This so-called financier, producer of the film, cut off the real end. The real end was in the name of the law, and then you saw three mothers. And one mother was the mother of the first child. And she said, this doesn't bring our children back to life. We have to watch our children much better. This was why I really made the film. For this one line, you have to watch your children much better. They cut it off, period. Fritz, you used actual criminals in the kangaroo court scene. Yeah. Why? And how do, how were you able to get them to do that? <clears throat> I told you that I was interested in Alexander Platz and so, and I met a lot of criminals. And I asked them if they would like to work in a film of mine. Certain people said, Fritz, we would like to, but we have never been photographed. We cannot afford it. And other people said, yes. So I paid them and they came. And there was a very peculiar thing. During the shooting, suddenly one came and said, look, we have to leave. The police will be here in an hour. They have heard about it. And I said, do you have 15 minutes more time? He said, yes, 15, but not long. I said, no. So I shot two more scenes, and then they left them, and the police came. Nobody was there. Do you feel, looking back now, Fritz, that the, uh, some of those films from your German period present a bleak view of the universe? If you look at a lot of film today, don't they do the same thing? I'm not concerned with the films of today. I'm concerned... I'm asking you. Oh, well, almost totally, yes. And you see. Well, this was 50 Look, years ago. when you put your finger on something, on an evil, you're not a politician. You cannot change it. But if you put <clears throat> your finger on an evil, which still exists, that's it. Let me ask you, other artists of that period, like George Groves, who was working in Germany at the same time, yeah. was making drawings and paintings of, of the bloodshed, of the rampant criminality, of the, of the dissatisfactions and evils of the society of, around him. Your films of that period, of, and slightly later, right on up through M, for, for 10 or 11 years, were dealing up to the 1933, when you left Germany, were dealing with the social ills that we now look back on and see as the dissatisfaction that led to Nazism. You cannot live in a country which has lost the war without being influenced. It's a time when I made Dr. Mabuse as a gambler and the second film, Inferno. There were big posters all over Berlin, a skeleton <coughs> dancing with a woman. And the headline was, Berlin, your dancer is death. I had finished a film, The Last Will and Testament of Dr. Mabuse in which I put into the mouth of Mabuse, when he steps into the body of another man, all the Nazi slogans. And the yellow shirts came. They didn't have the black shirts in these days, with two guns right and left, and said, <coughs> Mr. Goebbels will confiscate this film. I was very haughty 
and said, if you think you can confiscate a film of Fritz Lang in Berlin, do it. <laughs> All right, they did it. Now I had some trouble. The trouble was that the company for whom, for which I made this film, had spent some money. And I tried to find a way to help them and thought maybe that an interview with Goebbels would help. So that the confiscation would take me off. <clears throat> so one day I got an invitation, meaning an order, to arrive at the Ministry of Propaganda. <laughs> now you must understand one thing in these days. You have to have a stiff collar, a taxi, not a tuxedo, uh, cutaway. Cutaway coat. A vest, striped trousers, <clears throat> which was in its way already very uncomfortable. And I walked in to the Ministry of Propaganda, and immediately at the door was a big desk, and again, four people yellow shirts with the guns. What do you want? I said, here's an invitation from the Minister of Propaganda who wants to talk with me. Well, they looked at it and then they said, look, you go around the corner and go along this corridor. And then you come to another corridor and then you go there. Okay. And so I walked this corridor. It was not very agreeable. The floor were great squares of cement. The walls were blank, no picture, no inscriptions, and every step echoed constantly from the wall and back and so on. It was a disagreeable. So I come to the end of the corridor and another corridor, and there is the same thing. Again a desk. Again, four people with guns in yellow shirts, the same procedure. They go in this direction, it happens three times. Finally, I came to a round room. It was very nice, and I didn't know what to do. So suddenly, one of the door opens, and out came a man, most polite, and said, Mr. Lang, one moment. The minister will be ready in a second. And in reality, in a minute or a minute and a half, he said, he opened the door again and said, come in. I walked in. It was a tremendous big room. And the one side, at least four or five big windows where you could look outside. Goebbels sat behind a desk very, very far away. He had black trousers and one of these yellow-green shirts, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, something very funny. Goebbels could turn on friendliness like a faucet. <laughs> he came out with stretched hands and said, Mr. Lang, I'm so very, very happy to see you here. Come sit down. Okay, I sat down. And now I expected that he would talk to me. Why I had to put in the mouth of a criminal certain slogans of the Third Reich. <coughs> what were the slogans? Do you remember? What was one of them? Hitler has said, we have, no, not we, the average citizen has to destroy the authorities which he created. And then, on the debacle, on the rest, we will create our realm of thousand years. And I had Mabuse saying exactly the same only, and when everything is destroyed, on this rest, I will create my realm of thousand years of crime. Mm -hmm. Well, 
I expected that the minister would say something, but he didn't. So I was waiting, and he spoke and spoke, and suddenly he said, the Führer has seen your films. He didn't see which one. Mm -hmm. And then he said, and he has said, this is the man who will give us the National Socialistic Film. In this moment, to tell you the truth, I was wet all over my body. Perspiration <coughs> broke out everything. I looked out of the window, and there was, I don't know how you say it in English, you know, a big, big post. Yes. Like you have it here with lamps on. And there was a three-side clock. Yes. And you could watch the clock. And I said, how do I get out of here? To yourself? To myself, no, naturally. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I said to Goebbels, so help me God. But in essence, I said, I'm tickled pink. And I was looking at the hands of the clock, and they moved and moved, and my only idea was, how do I get out of here, get to the bank, get some money out of the bank, and leave Germany. And I said, Herr Minister, I don't know if you know one thing. My father comes from an old peasant family, mm -hmm. hundred and hundred years back. My mother was born Catholic, but her parents were Jewish. So again, he turned on his charm and said, Mr. Lang, we decide who is an Aryan. I said, thank you. <laughs> what should I say? What could I say? I didn't want it to end in a concentration camp. We want you to become the leader of the German film. Therefore, I said to him, the think about my mother, you know? Yes. What year was this, by the way? 33, beginning of 33. Mm -hmm. So he said, look, there's a scene when the professor who runs the insane asylum in which uh, uh, Mabuza died is driving home. And suddenly near him appears Mabuza and tells him certain things. It's wrong. That's not good. And I listened. And he said, the professor has to be killed by the rage of the audience. Oh, Herr Minister, I said, that is a wonderful idea. I thought it stinks to I am, but what should I have said? Well, we talked and talked and talked. And finally, the clock came to a point where I saw it was too late to go to the bank. Then, with all his charm, he said goodbye. <clears throat> I will call you in one or two days. <laughs> Wait for me. I said, Herr Minister, I'm most grateful and most honored. Saba, saba, blah, blah, and walked out. I went to the bank, the bank were closed. So I went home. I lived on a place called Breitenbachplatz, which on one side was a rounded from houses, but on the back of the houses were empty places where this later could build houses, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said to my servant, Hans, he was Polish. <coughs> I don't think that in the next days I will find a job here in Germany. I had constantly worked with France and with England, so fortunately I had a passport. I said, you know, put into the big 
everything, everything what I need for maybe a month, a month and a half. And as I looked out of the window in the back room, the whole house was surrounded by Nazis in yellow uniform. I said, oh, Mr. Goebbels didn't trust you. I said, Hans, here's money. You go, which was called Bahnhof Zoo, Bahnhof Amt Zoo, and there I meet you at 8 o'clock. The train to Paris goes at 8 o'clock by one sleeping car, uh, one... Yes. Uh, things. Okay. Then I went to my sweetheart <coughs> and said to her, look, you were once married to a Jew. You have two children. Nobody knows what may happen to you. Shall I take a part of your jewelry outside of Germany? We talked it over and she said yes, and she gave me some of them. When I left the house, they let me go. In other words, it just so happened that it they were on maneuvers. It accident that on this afternoon or night time, they prepared for night maneuvers or such kind of a thing. And I arranged it so that I arrived five minutes to eight o'clock. It's a train. And my servant Hans was very nervous, running up and down and up and down. I said, Mr. Lang, where have you? I said, what is the excitement? He gave me my bills and I stepped into the car and we drove up and I said, I will telephone you or I will telegraph you that you come after me. Fine. <coughs> Now, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the jewelry. I went to another car, and I had some white tape. And I put the jewelry with the tape behind the toilet, you know? Mm -hmm. If something happened to me, it was not my car. I don't give a damn. And then I went. <coughs> to my car to hide the five 1,000 mark bills. I took a razor blade, made a cut in the carpet, and then came the great disappointment. The carpet was glued to the floor. I couldn't put the money underneath. In these days, I think, you stopped at Herbestal, and you have to wait an hour and a half till you got into Belgium, you know? Mm -hmm. And during this time, there was an inspection of your luggage. But this time, it was an inspection by the yellow shirts. So I was on the one end of the car, and I heard them on the other end of the car knocking at the door and said, open up, pass control. Okay, they opened up. The next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. And then they came to the one next to me. The compartment next to you. Yeah. And in my compartment, I was lying on my bed and I remembered that I always had said to my actors, if you wanna give a good act, try really to do what you are playing. So I started to snore. I didn't sleep. I heard them in the next room. Thank you, closing the door. And I was waiting, now they would open.
they pass by. And I said, uh-huh. Goebbels had somebody watching you when you left the house, and they had somebody watching you here on the train, and just in three quarters of an hour, when the train is leaving for Belgium, they will arrest you. Nobody came. The train left, and still today, so help me God, I don't know why nobody came into my apartment. So I went, took the jewelry, next morning I took the five $1,000 bills, and I was in Paris. But I still don't know why nobody opened the door. I have to go back to something. At the beginning of my film career, if you want to use this word, I believed in fate. Slowly, with the years, I didn't believe in fate anymore. Fate is nothing that comes to you and you cannot escape. Fate is something that what you make out of your life. And my last films, which I made in this country, would have dealt with this. Now, that, let me say in my American films, for example, in, uh, what was the first? Fury. One? In Fury. There still exists a kind of lynching when I made it. Lynching, lynch mobs. Yeah. It is an evil, but I cannot change it. I can only point it out. And the same thing is we, you only live once. And naturally, I will admit one thing. You know that here, in the schools, religion is not taught. How will you teach ethic if not with religion? I'm not a religious man, but ethic you learn only through religion. I hate to give interviews. I will tell you why. I usually said, when a director or maybe the word is better, film creator, makes a film, and the film doesn't express what he wants to say, and he needs to give an interview to explain to an audience why and who. He's a lousy director, shouldn't make any films. His films should speak for him. <laughs>